Well, are these what you settled on, are they? <laughs> are they the pants you settled on, are they? Yeah. <laughs> Do you mind? No. <laughs> Hello. Uh, before I start, this was meant to be C sharp eight. Yeah, I've been doing a few talks and mostly C sharp eight with a few bits of Son Diamond Sora and stuff. Um, and Mike's working. Everyone can hear. I don't think the mic's working. Like Good. Actually. Is it not? No, it's switching no. to Mike on the box. Oh, the box. Which which box? The pack that's attached to you. Aha. That better. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh -huh. yeah. Okay. Uh, firstly, just to say. This is the most relaxed and laid back meetup I have ever been to. This is wonderful. Um, and thoroughly encourage you to help later on the uh, C sharp coding to beginners. Uh, it's really, really hard to explain C sharp to beginners. At least I tried a few years ago to write a book for completely new developers, like here's C sharp from nothing. And I gave up because I'm not up to it. Uh, I may try again at some point, like when I've retired or something. Uh, but it's really, really hard. So that's a fantastic effort um, to support. And I would strongly encourage you also, Jim Bennett is fantastic and Julie Lerman is also fantastic. Uh, I'm sure all the speakers you get here are fantastic, but they are particularly good. Um, so I have one more thing to say before I start actually on C Sharp 8. And people who've heard me talk before can probably guess what I'm going to say. Yes. What am I going to say? Where are the women? We're here! <laughs> there should be more of us! There should be more! So, I, you know, you've heard me rant about this before, but the diversity in tech is A, important, B, a genuine real issue, C, the world would be better for us as well as the women if we made it a better tech, uh, better industry, um, and it is fixable, and it's up, up to us to fix it. So those are the, the things to remember from longer diversity rounds. Um, okay, let's dive straight into C-sharp 8. I should apologize, I am already out of date because I was driving when Visual Studio 29 was released. Uh, I did not turn on my dongle and sort of install while downloading from a 3G card. Uh, that felt like a bad idea and just generally updating just before a demo. You never know exactly what's changed. Um, I have had to change the project file since I last gave this talk like three weeks ago because the language version um, identifier has changed. Um, how many of you have already used either the preview or have been smarty pants and downloaded Visual Studio 2019 release already? Okay, not me. This is good. Um, this means I can get away with being wrong. Um, <laughs> hopefully I won't be, but there may well be bits that I'm not quite sure and if if you ask me a question and I say, I don't know, let's find out, um, that's a very good thing. This is one of, one of the things I love about live coding, uh, that things can go wrong and I can learn as well, and it's all good. Um, just to be aware, just because Visual Studio 2019 is out, this does not mean that C Sharp 8 is out. At least not unless things have changed massively since you know, a couple of weeks ago when I, I did here. Yeah, we're, we're launching Visual Studio 2019 C Sharp 8 is still in preview. As far as I'm aware, .NET Core 3 is still in preview. I'm expecting those two to be firmly tied together. Um, I'm hoping it'll be later in this year, but there's, there's a fair amount of work to do, which I will come on to, um, mostly around learnable reference types. So we have, how long have I got before people pass out? I don't know. Oh. Hour, hour and a half. Hour and a half, right, okay. With an hour and a half, we can probably actually cover most of these features. Um, I have tried covering all of C Sharp 8 in 45 minutes. It is not a pretty sight. Um, <laughs> we can probably spend 45 minutes on nullability and 45 minutes on the other features. So, uh, as you can guess, none of all reference types are the big feature in C Sharp 8, and I'm going to say a few things many, many times. Uh, the two big things to start with are when you install Visual Studio 2019 and open up all your projects, nothing will have changed in terms of null reference types. Okay? Nothing. You have to enable it before it kicks in at all. Um, you can enable it in two ways. One is on a per file basis, or in fact, you know, within a file, it's like regions. You, know, you can disable nullability just for the using directive if you're really strange. 
um, and then re-enable it afterwards, etc. Um, I'll come back to what this directive means in a minute. Uh, you can also enable it in the project file, and I've enabled it on, I think, all these project files. So you need to specify that the language version is preview. Previously, that was C Sharp 8.0, or sorry, just 8.0. Um, as of recent previews, I think from preview 3, you had to put preview instead of 8.0. Um, and then this nullable context options enable, that's like having hash nullable enable at the top of every file and nothing else. Okay? There are many options for nullable context options. Enable, disable, and a couple that I don't know the details of yet. They are somewhat covered. They're going to be documented more over time. Um, but we'll, as we explore the feature, uh, I can go into a bit more detail about why it's a complex feature that needs complex enabling. Um, we'll also talk a bit about when you'll want to actually use this and how you start migrating things. So, you load up an existing project, it doesn't have nullable context enabled, um, it doesn't have line version preview, and everything is just as it was before. If you do a new project, uh, at least when this is all fully supported, I'm expecting that you'll probably not get a line version because by then 8.0 will be the default, but you will get nullable context options enable um, as a new thing in every at least .NET Core SDK style project that you create, and um, why would you create any other kind of project these days? Um, do you, if you really like seeing every source file listed in your project file, go ahead. But, um, so, you enable nullable context options in your existing project, and you recompile, and nothing will change in terms of the output. Okay? The exact IL will still be as it was before. You'll just have hundreds and hundreds of warnings, possibly thousands. Well, probably whatever you set the limit for the number of warnings you want to be. Um, this is fine. This is a good thing. All is working in that case. Um, but I've sort of talked about enabling the feature and nothing about what it is yet. Um, you've probably got some idea already, but we'll go from sort of from scratch. So I've got a very simple class called person. This is C Sharp 7 code, as it were, um, assuming I've got rid of everything I did last time I did the demo. Um, so we have a person class that has first name, last name, middle name. It's immutable. We pass in constructor parameters. Um, we copy things to the properties. Um, first sort of diversion, which I'm going to just comment this out rather than deleting it, because at least in earlier previews, there was some weirdness where the uh, nullable reference type feature didn't work with this particular construction. But if you do have a constructor like this, get used to using an expression bodied constructor like this. Uh, sorry, no, it's first name, last name, middle name, equals first name, last name, middle name. So that is in language terms, this is a tuple literal that's then being deconstructed into properties. And in fact, the C Sharp 8 compiler is, or even the C Sharp 7 compiler is sufficiently smart that although you need to have value tuple in either the framework or as a, as a reference, um, it doesn't bother constructing the tuple. It just assigns to the properties. So this code is exactly the same as this assigning the values. Um, but it's a really nice way of saying, well, it's expression bodied, so it can only do a tiny bit, and it's just copying stuff. Um, so it's sort of a hint to the reader, given that it's expression bodied, it can't be doing much stuff, it's just assigning. It's a handy little bit of syntax. So let's go back to old style syntax uh, so that we don't find out whether the bug was there or not. Person class is simple, everyone finds so far. Good. Okay. Now we've got a main method as normal, so this project is set up with a startup object of program that just runs a little application chooser that I have in the johnskeep.demo um, nougat package that just tries to find main methods elsewhere and offers you which one you want to run. Okay, so don't be confused by there being multiple main methods, it's purely for the sake of demo. 
So we're going to construct one object with my names and one object with uh, Miguel de Casa's names, and Miguel does not have a middle name, and then call this print name length method twice, once with me and once with Miguel. Um, this is a very long-winded way of writing this code, and that's deliberate so that we can delve into individual bits really easily. In particular, it's not using an interpolated string literal. All of this would work with interpolated string literals. This is just um, pedagogical code. So we're extracting the first, middle, and last names to local variables. <coughs> we're then extracting the length from each of them. And one of these days, I will remember to commit this change. But everywhere else, I've got first, last, middle. Right, hang on. <laughs> um, right, so all of this code is, oh no, I have no network in it. That's fine, it's committed. Uh, it's all at jskeep slash demo code under the C Sharp 8 folder. There's other fun stuff there, Spice Girls and stuff. Um, right, so all simple C Sharp 7 code, what do we think is going to happen? It's not a trick question, it's that easy when we run this code. I, I heard, yeah, exception. Um, it will also possibly be too small to read until I adjust font sizes. I never know what's going to happen at this point. That's properties, properties. Um, font, let's bump it up just a bit. And okay. That looks better. So this is basic <coughs> demo, and lo and behold, <coughs> oh, I'm running under debug. I hardly ever do that. So we do indeed have a null reference exception, as you would expect. And that's an odd kind of red um, <coughs> bubble. OK. And lo and behold, ignore the target indication bit, <coughs> exception bit. That's just the, uh, the demo runner catching it. OK. You will hear people telling you that the point of knowable reference types is to stop that kind of exception from happening. Um, that's a byproduct of the bigger thing, which is to have more clue about what you're able to express about your code. Um, so at the moment, we cannot express the fact that some people don't have middle names. Um, I would point out, never ever write code like this that assumes there's a first name, last name, and middle name. Um, just like, don't assume male or female, don't assume, there's, there's so many cultural things that are just too complex to get into today, but don't assume uh, that this is the structure of names around the world. Um, so, we can see that it's, our assumptions have been invalidated uh, already because Miguel doesn't have a middle name, and we're going to assume, for the sake of the next hour and a half, that we do want to model that everyone does have a first name and everyone does have a last name, but not everyone has a middle name. None of all reference types allow us to express that. Now, the name of the feature is a bit weird because previously we have always had non-nullable value types. We gained nullable value types in C-sharp 2, and now we're gaining Sorry, and we've always had nullable reference types. So how can we be gaining nullable reference types in C-sharp 8? Um, and the answer is that when I remove this line of code, that has just changed the meaning of all of the rest of the code in this file. Uh, we now don't have any nullable reference types in this file. They are all non-nullable reference types. Uh, this is unusual for the C-sharp team to be changing things. So in terms of backwards compatibility, it's all still compatible. As I said, the IL is exactly as it was before, but it's a bit weird to have completely changed the meaning of all your code by upgrading to a new version of the compiler. That's why you have to, well, it's one reason you have to opt into it, um, and it's one of the reasons why I'm very happy to be giving this kind of talk lots and lots, because there's a lot to learn um, just in terms of mental models. So, now that we have that code, uh, now that we, we have nullable reference types and non-nullable reference types, all of the code in here, we should see a warning when I can find my error list. So 
we have an error that's probably too small to read at the back, but it says, cannot convert null literal to non-nullable reference type, or nullability unconstrained type parameter. Uh, sorry, nullability is the project, or unconstrained type parameter. And that warning with the green squiggle is under the literal null. And that's basically saying, you are trying to pass an argument of the null literal to a parameter that is meant to be not null. What do you think is going to happen when I run this code? Exactly the same. Oh. Nice, exactly. It will go exactly the same as it did before because the IL is exactly the same as it was. And it didn't stop in the debugger because I read it without debugging this time. Um, so we still get a null reference exception, but at least now we know why. Um, we had been warned that bad stuff might happen because we're not being careful enough about nulls. So, this is where we start playing whack-a-mole. Um, we look at this null, and we look at string middle name, and you have to decide which of them is wrong. Is it that middle name shouldn't be non-nullable, or is it that we shouldn't be passing a null value? Um, you should expect, when going through and upgrading your code to C-sharp 8, you will find some, some bugs. Uh, you will find some bugs that are simple, oh, I didn't mean to do that, or I should handle that in a different way. Um, they're relatively easy. The tricky ones are where your, um, your code has two different opinions. Uh, half of your code thinks that should absolutely be nullable, and the other half thinks it should absolutely be non-nullable. Um, and that's a, a bug in the mental model that, that the code is expressing. In this case, we're going to say the bug is in the middle name. Uh, you know, it's not a bug in that we couldn't previously express that it could be null, but now we can, so we're going to. Uh, so how would you guess you expressed that the middle name parameter could be null? With a question mark. Exactly. Right, and let's just go down, and lo and behold, there is no green squiggly. Except there's one here now. <laughs> because we're trying to assign a nullable parameter to a non-nullable uh, property. So let's make that nullable as well. OK, and now we have two other squigglies. <laughs> And this, so I really want to reiterate that this is entirely normal and you should absolutely expect to be playing this. I, I call it whack-a-mole for good reason. Um, when I upgraded no time to C-sharp 8, I, sort of, I first built and there were about 300 warnings and then I went through and fixed, fixed them all um, before hitting build again and then there were about 120 and then I fixed some more and then there were about 150 and then I fix some more, and it went down to 90, and eventually it sort of starts evening out. Um, but you are pushing the idea of nullability around your code, and other bits aren't going to be ready for it yet. So expect it to happen. But let's see what's happening here. So we're saying, to start with, we want a local <coughs> variable called middle that's non-nullable string, and we want to copy that from person.middle name, which is nullable, and it's understandable that it's going to warn us that that could go wrong. Note this isn't an error, and if we debug to here, we'll find no exceptions. We have hit the breakpoint. Our non-nullable reference type has a value. Oh, sorry, the first time, fine. Uh, second time, our non-nullable reference has a value of null. You're familiar with static typing. You're familiar with dynamic typing. I think of nullable reference types as optimistic typing. It's probably going to be OK. Um, and it's warning you when it might not be. But it's not going to stop you from running the code. And that optimistic is the best we're going to get. And I'll give some uh, pathological examples later on of why you wouldn't actually want it to be stricter than this. So. Uh, our first warning here is saying uh, converting null literal or possibly null value to non-nullable type. Okay, I can understand that. And then it's saying possible dereference of a null reference. This is interesting because the compiler is saying this might be null. 
But the type of mill is non-nullable. And in particular, the type of first and last is the same as the type of middle, and it's not complaining about those. This is where there's the declared type of a variable, and the compiler keeping track of whether it thinks it might be null or not. And we'll come to more examples of that in a minute. So for the moment, let's start off by doing the obvious, making this a null string, and then we're just left with one, and oh, we'll just use the null conditional operator for the moment, and now, goodbye to the exception. And we end up printing a blank line. And OK, that's better than an exception, but it's still not terribly pretty. Um, I'm no UI designer, but I know that that's not as nice as not bothering to put middle up there at all. So let's see what happens when we want to do something different when middle is null. So if middle is null, we're going to print um, just the first and last lengths. Get rid of that. OK, uh, firstly, is everyone familiar with pattern matching? And uh, even if you're familiar with pattern matching, you may not be aware this is the now preferred way of checking whether something is a null reference. It's just the constant pattern null, um, <laughs> but there is a subtle difference between that and this. Everyone guess what the difference is going to be? Equals could be overloaded. Equals is overloaded for string. So this is actually calling into the overloaded double equals operator in string. Um, we really don't want that. And anytime you're comparing against null, you're in a pretty weird situation if you want it to actually go into an overloaded operator because it might do something other than check whether it's a null reference. Um, there are some cases, but it's odd. So uh, that is the preferred way. And in particular, if you're writing uh, the equality operators for something like string, uh, you can now do that instead of calling object.reference equals um, or casting something to object and checking. So that's just a nice way of checking for nullity. OK, so uh, if middle is null, we're going to do that. Otherwise, we're going to print out what we were printing before, but I'm going to make a change and just use middle.length. We can wait a little while, but I don't think any green squiggles are coming back. <coughs> so previously, and in fact, I can just, if I just comment out the else, so it will unconditionally do this, the squiggle will come back. Okay, it's only not there because it's in the else the else clause for this if middle is null. So the compiler tracks the nullability of a variable, and even if it's declared non-nullable, it can say, "Hey, I think that's going to be null, or might be null because you were copying the value from something that was null," um, and it can tell, "Hey, I've." checked that this isn't null, so even though the declared type is nullable, I'll still let you dereference it. Okay, so it's doing sort of interesting flow control. Now, I don't like these having these extra variables around, so let's get rid of that and do person.middle is null, and uh, person.first name. Thank you. And look, it even gives me a squiggle that's... Uh... Okay, and let's just check that works here. It really, really should. Fine. So what is surprising about this? We're used to tracking the, the compiler tracking definite assignment. You know, either a variable is assigned or it's not. Uh, definitely assigned or it's not. Or weird statuses in the middle of a condition of uh, definitely assigned if true and things. <coughs> but we don't have a variable here. We're looking at a property. The compiler is assuming that if person dot middle name is null, we'll go into here. And by the time we've got into this else person.middleName will still not be null, so it's okay to use this. 
That may not be true. Um, let's see whether this is the example I know. Okay, let's make basic demo be a bit naughty and say, well, if we'll have a the real mid lane, and we'll just make it so that it can be a bit shy. will give it a always a non-null value in that case. Um, why is that saying? Oh, thank you. Uh, right, so now we assign the real, real middle name that may or may not be null, and the middle name property, if we're right at the start of a minute, will always return non-null, <coughs> otherwise it will return real middle name. So if we happen to hit this if clause, at the start of a minute, oh, it's returned non-null. OK, I'll go into the, elf clause, the else clause. I don't know why I keep calling them elf clauses. <laughs> Coming up to Easter, not Christmas. Um, then if the clock has ticked and we're now at second one, or if it's been really slow and it's on second ten or something, and we're looking at the other Carta, then person.middle name will now return null, and it will go bang. Okay, maybe you shouldn't have properties that do that. Um, just a little hint. Uh, but it does mean, you know, there could be other threads mucking around with things. Stuff can happen. This is why it's optimistic. It's saying, if you're writing normal code, you're probably going to be okay. But for my, to my mind, just to reiterate, and you'll get sick of me saying this, the benefit isn't that we stop the null reference exception. The benefit is in the person class where we're able to say, hey, these two properties are different from this property. Now, I've already got a, uh, a to-do here, which is to validate the arguments. Um, and I still need to do that. Um, there is uh, a fun way of doing this at the moment. Um, name of first name. So with throw expressions and the uh, null coalescing operator, um, we can throw an exception if the argument is null. And obviously, we shouldn't do that if the, uh, we shouldn't do it for middle name because we're saying that it can be null. You should absolutely have code like this, or you know, I have something like preconditions this code won't compile, so that's why I'm keeping the other one. Uh, preconditions dot check not null first name name of first name. Okay, in every code base that I work on on a regular basis, there's something like this. I've written this code far too many times. Um, you still need that code. Currently, there is no way of not having that code um, and still getting the effect that you want. It's possible that by the time C-sharp 8 is actually out, um, you'll be able to write either that or that, um, which basically it will only be valid on a parameter, and it will say, please check the parameter for me, because it's boilerplate code, and it's really tedious doing it by hand. But at the moment, it's not doing it by default, as we could see by the fact that we were able to pass in null for the middle name earlier on. Um, and that brings me on to the other piece of syntax for nullable references, <coughs> which is the dammit operator, um, also known as the null, null asserting, I can't, everyone's just going to call it the dammit operator, so <laughs> let's just go with that. Um, so that's where normally in production code, you would only use this operator in cases where you know better than the compiler does, and you have validated that something is safe for whatever reason. Um, that it's also useful in unit test code that I'll come to in a sec. Uh, but basically, it says, whatever you think about the nullability, 
I'm going to force you to think that something isn't going to be null. And the most pathological way of doing that is to put it on the null literal. And this is just the exclamation mark. It's sort of, no, this is not null, damn it. Um, so where previously, yeah, let's, let's take away Miguel's surname. I'm sure he won't mind. Um, so we get a warning there. If we want to say, I don't like warnings, and rather than fixing them, I prefer to just silence them. Um, you put that exclamation mark, and you feel potentially a little bit bad about it, but it silences the warning. So there are cases where this is useful. Uh, I have needed it in a couple of places in no time. Firstly, where I have reason within a small local block saying, well, I know that something isn't null, even if the compiler can't work it out. And another is a case, it's actually when I'm parsing some text and I've got the result of parsing, which could be a value, so a local date or an instant or whatever, or it could be an exception. And I don't throw the exception immediately, so I let you check whether it was successful or not, or if you just fetch the value, then it'll throw the exception if there was one. Uh, so it's sort of like the best of parse and try parse. You know, it's, it's cheap when there's an exception, but you're checking and uh, you still get a useful exception rather than just, well, it returned false um, in, in cases that you didn't expect. But that means that I've got a value that I know is non-null in every case where there's not an exception. But there's no way I can express that within the C-sharp type system. So I know that I will not, if this is an internal field, um, and I know I'm not going to refer to it and expect it to be non-null unless I've checked that there's no exception. So I know it's okay, but I need to use the dammit operator to say I know better than you do. Um, think of it as a single character version of a cast. We're already used to telling the compiler we know better than it. Whenever you do a cast that's not sort of just for the sake of converting a decimal to a double or something, if it's converting a reference type saying I've got an object but I know it's a string, cast to a string. That's saying, I know better than you do, compiler, but please check it at <laughs> execution time. There's no checking at execution time here. It will just continue. Um, so again, this is adding no IL whatsoever. The only feature that is going to add any IL is if we ever do get to say string exclamation mark. So that brings me to the second usage of the DAMS operator, which is when writing unit tests. I made a change to this code. There should be a test validating that that change was the right thing to do. I should have a test saying, if I pass null as the first name, it should throw argument null exception. If I pass null as the last name, it should throw argument null exception. If I pass null as the middle name, it shouldn't throw anything at all. I don't have those tests in front of me. Um, but how would you write those tests? In NUnit, I would say assert.throws, open bracket, Lambda expression, um, new person, um, null, empty string, empty string. And then I get a warning. And I don't want warnings on my unit tests. I am very, very deliberately trying to pass null. And just because I don't want that to happen without a warning in production code, in the unit test code, it's exactly what I want. So um, my unit test code for node time is chock full of null bang um, things. Those are the only bits of syntax to know, uh, but it's worth exploring a few areas of null reference types that are either tricky or don't work as well as we want them to uh, because we don't have more syntax um, or just extra rules. So let's give Mikkel his, Mikkel his uh, name back. Um, Let's look at generics to start with. Generics are tricky, and this has changed over the course of previews. Um, imagine I could write this. There will be a green scribble in a minute, or in fact, possibly an error. Um, an error. <coughs> what would that mean if we could do it? Okay, we have a T question mark for an arbitrary T. There are two reasons why we can't do this. Firstly, if you use string, then that makes sense, it's a string question mark. If you use int, it makes a certain amount of sense as an int question mark. That causes another problem I'll come on to in a sec. But what if t itself were 
string question mark or int question mark. It's like, it's really nullable value. It's particularly nullable. I feel really bad about this one. It's, ah, it's almost certainly null. Um, so there's one aspect of just how null are you going to go. Um, and the other is the huge difference between nullable value types and nullable reference types. Um, nullable reference types are just an idea in the mind of the compiler. They do not exist at execution time at all. Um, they, ex they exist in the metadata that's uh, built in the IL, so you get attributes saying, hey, I know about nullable reference types and nothing here is nullable. I know about nullable reference types and some stuff in here is nullable, um, or all of it is nullable. I've got a blog post about the, uh, the attribute. It gets kind of interesting if you have a dictionary from string question mark to list of string question mark, question mark, and the whole thing is question mark because you know, various bits may or may not be null. Um, so that's just for one field or parameter. There can be a mixture of null abilities um, with generics and arrays and things. Um, but apart from that, the CLR has no idea of these nullable reference types. So when it comes to if this is int, then this is a particular, this is a different type to T at the CLR level, something's about to take off next week. <laughs> I'm not quite sure what's, something's very loudly funny. Um, uh, whereas with string, it would be exactly the same thing. So you're not allowed to do that. Um, <laughs> you sure? Um, so you can use uh, T question mark, um, uh, sorry, where if t is constrained to be a struct, that's fine. We now know that that always means nullable of t, and that's what will end up in the IL. And if it's a class, then the IL ends up with just t, but with extra metadata to, to help the compiler. So that's generics. Let's move on from generics to um, the awkwardness of some interfaces. So, I quality comparer of T has two methods. You can compare two values, or you can get the hash code of a value. If you compare two values, it should accept null references and should return true if they're both null, false if either of them is null but not the other, and actually do the comparison otherwise. Fine. Get hash code should go bang with an argument null exception if you pass it null. So what do you do? If you try to implement I equality comparer of string, then the parameters to equals have to be string. And then get hash code is okay because um, you know, that takes a non-nullable thing and we're, we're not expecting it to be nullable. Whereas if we implement I equality comparer of string question mark, then now our equals method is fine because you know they're expected to be nullable, it's all good. But now get hash code says, yeah, give me your nulls, your weak and huddle masses, uh, but I'm gonna throw an argument null exception. You you said it was okay. No, not so much. <laughs> um, I checked this one with Mads and he believes that yes, you should implement this and if you have a um, class, uh, this should be equatable, um, should implement I equatable of, this should be equatable question mark. So that is, I gather, the right thing to implement. Uh, but it took me a bit of a while thinking, well, what do I, what do I actually want it to do at this point? Um, but you almost certainly want to allow people to pass in now. Okay. Um, I said that there were cases where you want to use the um, dammit operator because you can see in one small block of code things that should be okay, but it thinks aren't. And uh, let me see, here's an example. Um, so we're calling object.reference equals, and this bit of the demo is always exciting because I never know what's going to happen. Um, in some ways, what you're about to see may be a bug, but it's possible that they fixed it. Who knows? <laughs> um, let's get rid of the warnings. 
and see what happens. So, uh, if we're saying if text is null, so this is this is uh, <laughs> philosophically equivalent, to, morally equivalent to if text is null, okay? But, oh good, they haven't fixed it. Um, but still, the compiler says, oh no, it might be null. We absolutely know that it won't be. Um, this is a very simple example, but there can be other things where you know you have proved in your code, in that bit of code that you can see, you're not relying on some other bits of code elsewhere. Um, so I'm just going to, oh, it's landing now. Um, <laughs> I'm just going to use the bang operator to say, it's, it's fine, I've got this. Um, I have been getting into the habit of when I use this, because it's relatively hard to find exclamation marks, um, I suppose searching for exclamation mark dot may be simpler, but I tend to write a something like to do um, null ref or something that is a comment I will be able to find later on because I expect this to be fixed later on. Um, for reference equals, it's relatively easy, it could be fixed. The other thing we could do is if string dot is null or empty, text. And that one, interestingly enough, it knows about. Now, there is nothing in the language of what I've described so far that would explain the compiler removing the warning there. So either the team has uh, hard-coded string dot is null or empty as a I know what this means, and they haven't bothered to do object reference equals for reasons that are, you know, who knows. Um, or they have decorated string dot is null or empty with something that has not, as far as I'm aware, been made public, but I suspect will before C sharp 8 comes out. And the reason you need to know about that is you'll want it for your code too. So I've shown you two methods so far. Object dot reference equals has the special property that if one of the arguments you know to be definitely a null reference and the other is a mystery thing and that returns false, then you know that mystery thing is not null. String dot is null or empty has the magical property that if it returns false, then the argument was not null. So you want the compiler to, to know about that. Let's see the kind of thing that we might want to do. So suppose we write the null or double method, which propagates its nullity. So null input leads to null output. Um, and there are lots of things like this, particularly in link to XML. So if you cast an X element to string, it's fine to do that on a null reference and you'll get a null reference. It's really, really handy. Um, as opposed to using dot value, which will go bang. Uh, so you can cast a string and null input gives null output. This particular case happens to concatenate the non-null input instead. So what we would like is for, when we get rid of the um, warning disablement, what we would like is for this to not have a warning. We should be able to assign to a non-nullable string because we're passing in something that is non-nullable as well. So if we're saying, compiler, trust me, this won't be null, then the compiler should trust that the output won't be null either. Whereas we would want it to warn about this. It should be saying, well, you know, the contract doesn't apply. You're passing in something that could be null, so the output could be null as well. I expect there to be something like um, contract uh, input null goes to return null. I don't know what, what exactly it will look like, but some sort of mini language expressed as strings, but hopefully with compiler support to sort of say, hey, these are magic strings that I know about and I will check that they at least look vaguely the same. Um, and the compiler will, would then be able to reason about knowing, ah, you've passed in, or the only way that it can return null output is if the input was null. Or it might say input not null means return not null. That's, that's really what we're saying um, is useful. That's how we say that's not null, therefore the return is not null, so please don't give me a warning. 
This does not in, uh, exist yet, um, and I have seen no previews of this, which is why I was reasonably comfortable to say that Visual Studio 2019 does not have the final version of C Sharp 8, um, or if it does, it won't have this. The C Sharp team is really smart. There is no way they're going to release this sort of mini language without it going through several previews so that we can all find out what we want it to say. Um, and that's where I'm appealing, please do install Visual Studio 2019 and start playing with this so that you can work out what contracts you will need. And as soon as you can put the contracts in, um, start experimenting with them. Uh, let's see, so, I've said that the, uh, the compiler knows about the is with a null reference. It also does know if we did, uh, let's put this pragma back so that we can get rid of the warnings. Come on. Okay. Um, I didn't show, but can do now. Uh, the compiler is perfectly happy if you do use the double equals operator, it will assume that means um, I'm checking against null, even if it's calling an overloaded operator. Now, that may not be a valid assumption. So we could have an equality operator that just always returns false. Nothing is equal to anything else, including nulls not being able, not being equal to each other. Um, and at that point, you can say, um, say that something is null. If it's null, write x was null, otherwise write x dot value. And the compiler thinks that that's all fine, that x can't possibly be null here, but we can uh, sneaky custom quality, we get a null reference exception. So again, just like our weird property, um, if you write equality operators that don't follow the conventions that the compiler expects, bad stuff can happen. Um, likewise, in parameters, right, in parameters can't be changed, right? So if you've already checked that this in parameter is null, you know, we, we can't even write text is null here. That, that won't compile. Um, so it's fine to use text.length here, right? Well, not really, because in is just ref with a bit more rigor within the method. So the method can't change it. There's nothing to stop other code from changing it such as a delegate that just sets, you know, it's setting this local variable to null, but that local variable is aliased with the parameter here. So when we call the delegate here, that sets that local variable to null in main, which sets text to null in here, because they're the same thing, which means this goes back. Um, I won't go on and on about other places where you can screw the compiler over, um, but the, the main thing is this is a different type of type safety. This is, uh, anywhere else you can't assign values wrongly. You, know, you, you can't, if I were to try to change text to something that's a non-string, so um, you know, if I try to make this text equals new object, then we get compile time checking that says, no, this is meant to be a string variable. You can't do that. At other places, we get execution time checking um, as soon as things are violated. So if you cast, that cast is immediately checked um, if it's a cast from you know, <coughs> reference types. Nullable type safety, we've seen um, you can assign a null value to a non-nullable variable and it will all just keep executing until you dereference it, at which point an exception will be thrown. So it is, in some ways, the worst type of type safety. You know, it's, it's not guaranteeing you anything, it's not going bang as soon as it's being violated, it's just saying, yeah, you're probably okay. It's the compiler cheering you on um, rather than guaranteeing anything. But, again, it lets you express stuff. And if you think of code more about expressing a view of the world instead of building something that you can execute, then this is a really, really big deal because you can now express things about the world in a far better way than you could before. In the same way, it, it's quite similar to 
going from array list to list of T. As we just, how many of you were doing .NET before generics? Oh, and that proportion's only going to go down over time. <laughs> I sort of, I feel that the rest of you are missing out because you won't express the joy of, wow, it's all type safe and efficient. It's fantastic. Um, but you get to experience this joy instead. It's, it's much the same, just a bit less safe. But in terms of expressing stuff about what you expect can be null or not, it's spot on. Uh, I think that's all I want to say about nullability. Um, so things to reinforce, I've already said about the type safety just now, but also it won't be turned on by default for you, and when you do turn it on, it will just give warnings that will become errors if you have treat warnings as errors, um, but it won't change the IL that's emitted. Um, different people have different opinions about how you're best to uh, migrate a code base. In the node time um, repo, I have several commits that are modifying nullability, you know, implementing nullable reference types, typically one project at a time. And I found it useful to go one project at a time so that you're not drowning. Um, if you're doing that with a large application, a large system that has sort of some top level projects and then you know, they depend on others that depend on others, and then you have some leaf projects that don't depend on anything else, go from the bottom up. Make the leaf projects know about nullability. Now they will be returning things saying, uh, hey, this might be null, this definitely won't be null. They will have parameters that are being, for methods that are being pulled from non null aware code, um, saying, hey, I can't be null. And we're just passing null into it blindly, no warnings, because the project that's calling it doesn't have null reference handling turned on. Um, which is another reason why you still need to do the validation, because you can't guarantee, certainly not if you're an open source project or you know, releasing a NuGet package, you can't guarantee that your callers will know anything about um, nullable reference types. And that's the, uh, the bit about nullable, enable, disable, and whatever the other options are. Maybe, maybe IntelliSense will fill us in about what they can be. Yeah, so they can be disable, enable, Restore, which is go back to what it was before you just did stuff, and safe only. Um, I honestly can't remember what safe only does. I think it affects if you are calling code. So I described the situation just now where you've got non C sharp 8 code calling into your lovely C sharp 8 null safe code, and it doesn't know what's going on. Fine. That's one scenario. What about your C sharp 8 code that's calling into JSON.NET or whatever it is that hasn't had nullability turned on? So your the compiler says, okay, you're calling this method. What's it returning to me? Ah, I don't know whether that's nullable or not. What should I do? And I think safe only probably says, I'll assume that everything is nullable. Um, when I'm calling into code that isn't aware of nullability. <coughs> because it's, it's always safe to assume that what you get back might be null and that you should check for it. It's not safe to assume that it won't be null. Make sense? Um, so there is already documentation on, on safe only. I've read it through. It was not entirely clear. I'm sure this will all become clearer over time. And I'll start writing C-sharp in depth five uh, <coughs> two. Um, there have been no questions so far, and I don't know whether that's because I've been incredibly clear or whether you've just not wanted to interrupt. Um, please, for the rest, do interrupt as soon as you have any questions, but for the moment, before we move on to anything else. Any questions? Yeah? Wait, 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 wait. Oh. Yes. <laughs> okay. Are you here, Chair? So it's not really. Hello? Yes. Okay. Um, not really related to your talk at all. <laughs> because you were very clear. But I noticed that you were using the, the in keyword in a parameter yes. as opposed to ref. Um, I've not come across that. What's Ooh, the difference? That's from C sharp. Uh, someone had a copy of fourth edition of C sharp in depth, and in the appendix it says exactly what version various things came in at. I think in parameters were C sharp 7.3. Um, and in parameter, 
is a ref parameter, but you guarantee not to mutate it within the method. And the reason you want that is so that you can use it with read-only structs, so that you can have a read-only variable, instance or static variable, and call a method on that without it taking a copy of it. Um, so if you've got a read-only variable in C sharp earlier, um, if it's a struct variable, if it's read-only, any method you call, um, the compiler doesn't know that the method won't mutate the state. So it has to take a copy and then call the method on the copy so that it won't mutate the read-only variable. Um, in C sharp 7.0 mumble, there are read-only structs which the compiler guarantees, hey, this is not mutating state anywhere in any method. And if you call one of those for an in parameter, it doesn't need to um, copy things. Um, and I'm thrilled that the description of that language feature references the blog post that I wrote on Node Time saying why I had various fields that I'd normally make read-only, but there was this bizarre performance boost because of weird bit of language um, by not having the read-only. And now they're read-only again. Yay. Um, and in fact, it, it benefits even if you don't have in-parameters, but uh, in-parameters and read-only structs sort of work well together. But normally, in-parameters guarantee that they won't modify the value within the method. But it's, it's really important to note that it doesn't mean that nothing else will modify that parameter along the way. 7.2, thank you. Um, so my personal tip is don't use in parameters for public methods. Uh, have just a regular value parameter and then use in within your own code where you know that you're only passing stuff to them and you won't be saying. I'm really done. There was another question. There was. The elusive answer. Um, hi, so you said at the beginning that there was a reason why it wasn't more strict than just kind of... Right, uh, yeah, so if it was strict, um, then we would have things like the this code here, okay? This code isn't safe, because if you have a nasty property implementation, um, it should give warnings for all of these. But that wouldn't be useful at all. Right. Um, and that's, yeah, it was handy that I happened to have this code to hand. Uh, because it's not going to introspect the property implementation. Aside from anything else, this could be in a different assembly, and the version of the assembly that you load may not be the one that you compiled against and, and stuff. So that's why it's not unbelievably strict, because it ends up being useless. Thank you. Any other comments? Don't be shy, please. Ooh. Okay, if you think of any more about another more reference types while I'm going over other stuff, uh, please just shout. Okay, so uh, the other features um, are asynchronous um, disposal and iterators. Um, I probably won't go into much of the async. Um, I never ever have enough time to go through all the C Sharp 8 features, even the ones that are already in preview. Um, so I'll just Describe briefly, you get to write um, using uh, you get to write things that return an async i sorry, an i async enumerable within an async method, and you get to do yield return. Yay! Because that's really painful to do otherwise. And then you get to use it um, by saying await oh, for each. So that's cool. Um, and likewise, there is an iAsync disposable, and you get to await using it. Um, there are issues around, well, how do you pass in a cancellation token? How do you say whether you want to configure await false or not? Um, and the story around that has changed a bit over time, and I'm not following it terribly closely until it's kind of resolved. Um, so I won't go into those in detail. Let's do fun things. Let's do switch expressions. I love switch expressions. Um, so the switch statement has not evolved much 
in C sharp for years and years and years. Certainly the, the general syntax has always been switch and then a value and then um, case stuff, case stuff, case stuff, maybe multiple cases um, and a default, but it's all a bit horrible. Um, C sharp seven introduced pattern matching, so you, your case could be um, a pattern rather than just a constant. And uh, if you want to think of there being two different kinds of switch statements, switch statements with just values and switch statements with patterns, knock yourself out. If you want to think there's only one kind of switch statement, it's just that every constant is itself a pattern, then that's accurate as well. Um, it's worth being aware that as of C sharp 7, the order of cases does matter um, because multiple patterns can match. If they're constants, only one constant will match. Um, the order before C sharp 7 didn't matter if everything compiled, but there are pathological cases uh, where changing the order of cases would make it fail to compile due to the weird scope rules. Switch expressions are what you, you know, what you see is what you get. Uh, instead of just being statements, they are expressions, which means they work with expression body members. And let's use the Fibonacci sequence as a way of demonstrating this. So here is a very procedural way of implementing the Fibonacci sequence. Everyone know what Fibonacci sequence is? So 0, 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13. Every value beyond the first two is the sum of the previous two. And uh, all of these, I think, apart from maybe the last one, are all implementing Fibonacci with recursion, which is a terrible idea. It just happens to be a really easy way of demonstrating switch expressions. So we check whether n is less than zero and nicely throw an argument out of range exception. We check for the, core, the base cases, otherwise we recurse. Nice and simple. No switch statements or switch expressions. Um, here's one that's C sharp you know, one. Uh, we will First check whether n is less than zero. Throw an argument, out of range expression, exception, sorry. Uh, I've just realized this is even lighter on your, uh, so let's do fib equals fib one, just as a way of using all of these methods. Um, two, three, uh, five, have I got five yet? Yeah. Okay, right, yay, you can read it. Um, so, this is effectively the same as the previous one, it's just that we're using a case instead of those if statements. Great, and this is C sharp one. Um, we can fold the check for n being less than zero into an old style switch statement, um, as in very old style, by using default. Okay, so it's not zero or one. If it's in range, then return the value, otherwise throw an exception. That's kind of horrible. But it does have the benefit that the whole thing is just one switch, uh, switch statement. Um, and we have gone straight from that to a switch expression. So I get to show the syntax now. So if I pin that, we might be able to just take this down a smidge. Okay. These two are equivalent code. So firstly, you can tell it's gonna be an expression because we're using it as the body of an expression body member. The change is the syntax. So hopefully by the time C sharp eight comes out uh, fully, this will all be done for you by the Roslyn refactoring and you'll just hit control dot, please make it into a switch expression. When you're doing it manually, you get used very, very quickly to changing switch brackets n to n switch so switch is now, I guess, an operator, a binary operator, where the left-hand side is a value, and the right-hand side is a braced list of patterns and results. So instead of saying case, you just start with the pattern. Uh, instead of a colon, you have a fat arrow. This is not a lambda expression. That's not a lambda expression. Uh, these are fat arrows. Um, no body shaming involved, it's just the easiest way of describing the syntax. Um, but I feel a bit guilty. Um, so, uh, I would say this is zero goes to zero, one goes to one, 
And note that instead of semicolons, these are commas. There's no such thing as default in a switch expression, but we don't need it because we have the underscore pattern, <coughs> excuse me, which discards anything that matches it. So this is a comma separated list of <coughs> patterns and results. And that's it. Um, one thing to note is there is no way of doing multiple, uh, matching multiple patterns and having them all handled by the same result. So we can't do sort of zero and three both go to zero. Um, it's possible, no, stop. <laughs> Don't correct me. <laughs> um, yeah, Visual Studio has its flaws when you're typing non-existent C sharp. Um, uh, in fact, it could be or, I think is more likely. Um, so if it's zero or three, then go to there's a zero. Uh, that's possible. That's being discussed on the Roslyn thing. Um, and you know, we might have and, we might even have not. Um, who knows? Um, I'm hoping at some point that if you remember the is null, I'm hoping at some point we get a better way of checking that something is not null, because at the moment yeah. you've got to do that, and that's ugly, uh, whereas that is, you know, imagine that we're all blue, um, it might make you feel a bit Visual Basic-y, which may make you feel sort of, oh, the good old days. Um, but I certainly, you know, regardless of the verbosity of not being a word, I definitely prefer that over the not being right at the start and then brackets and stuff. Um, <clears throat> and the, the C-sharp team is well aware that that's annoying. Um, I tend to use not equal for that just because it's simpler. Um, so, um, this is still using just constant patterns or the discard pattern. Um, what I didn't do, and I suspect this is another thing that I implement every time we get this talk, <coughs> is fib4b, where we say um, discard when n less than zero goes to, throw a new argument null exception, uh, argument attached range exception, and then that is now this. I don't know why I'm making it. I'm never going to run this code, but there we go. Just have it recursing to the wrong thing, just felt wrong. Um, so this, I would say, is a much cleaner way of representing our original code up here, but it's doing exactly the same thing. And if you think that a switch statement or a switch expression with patterns really is doing, if this pattern matches, then otherwise, if this pattern matches, is otherwise if this pattern. I guess to be closer it would be else if because um, then else return. Uh, so a switch statement or expression only matches, <clears throat> even if it matches several things it only executes one body. As it were. Um, but if you look at how sparse the information is in there there's an awful lot going on other than the interesting bits, which are, well, zero goes to zero, and one goes to one, and anything else goes to that, unless it's less than zero. Um, whereas this, the information density, is much, much nicer. Um, we have a squiggle because, oh, sorry, yeah, uh, it's even longer than it needs to be. It's just that. So the nice thing is, that's probably how the specification is written. And it's got no extraneous stuff. Um, Fib5 here is a, uh, a way of doing things with tuples, which is nice, <clears throat> but irrelevant for switch expressions. So uh, that's switch expressions themselves. There's more to say about patterns that will be expressed in switch expressions, so you'll see more of them in just a minute. <clears throat> but any questions on you know, the syntax and what they can do? Yeah? Can you use multiple wins to do what you were trying to achieve? Uh, you can only have one when clause. Uh, I could have um, underscore when n is zero or this. This is an arbitrary expression. Uh, 
So you could do that. Um, but then, so there are things that the compiler can do with constant cases. It can generate a jump tree <coughs> and it's all nice and efficient, whereas this is not going to be nearly as efficient. I am intrigued as to what it was prompting me to be. No, it was, there we go. N in space is not finite number exception. Mm -hmm. What kind of shortcut is that? Who is <laughs> using that so often? I need a two-letter two way of doing that. Wow, OK. Um, yeah. OK. Uh, where was I? So zero goes to that. Um, one thing just still on switch expressions, the compiler ensures that the the switch expression is exhaustive. So switch statements don't have to handle every input. Um, it's fine for it to just say, yeah, nothing matches, so I'm not going to execute anything. If you're um, as the, getting a result out of something, then yeah, it does need to actually produce a result, whatever the input. So if we say, well, zero goes to one, one goes to two, what are we going to do with five? And the compiler um, gives, you an uh, gives you a warning saying the switch expression does not handle all possible inputs. It is not exhaustive. Um, it used to have a really interesting way of turning this error into a warning, which is it would give you a warning at this point, but when you hit build, it would then, um, the IL emitter would say, no, what you're trying to do is not valid IL, which I thought was a, a pretty good hard warning. Um, but now it is just a warning, and if we execute this, it gives us, uh, if we execute the right project, it throws a switch expression exception. Um, so there may be some way of saying, do you know what, that's exactly what I wanted to do, because normally in my experience, when it's not exhaustive, either you don't want it to be a switch expression in the first place, or you have more knowledge that it's fine, and uh, I have this for node time where um, you can map a local time to a UTC time, and that mapping can end up with zero, one, or two results. So on Sunday morning, if you'd said 1.30, it would have said, there are no, no results. 1.30 does not exist. If you do the same thing in November or October, whatever it is, um, and say 1.30, it'll say, sure, do you want the, the early 1.30 or the late 1.30? It happens twice. And for almost all the cases, it just has one. So I know that in that case, I've either got zero, one, or two things. And currently, I have to have a default, throw new invalid operation exception, something's wrong in node time. And that's a bit that I will never get code coverage for because the world would have to be just, <laughs> yeah. There's no way that's going to happen. Um, even if you could have a time zone that went backwards multiple times, so it could theoretically happen, the rest of my code doesn't handle it, so you're not going to get to that bit of the switch case. Um, so it'd be nice if I could just say, I'm fine with the switch expression exception, um, and I don't want to have the code there that can't be covered. Um, but I don't know whether there's any way of, sort of want to be able to say, switch, switch, damn it. <laughs> but that's not currently the case. OK, um, more pattern matching. So uh, this is sometimes called recursive patterns, and it sort of goes into property patterns as well. How many of you have used C Sharp 7 and are vaguely, you're reasonably comfortable with patterns? OK, right, let's do quick um, whistle stops over patterns, in that there are two things to know about patterns, pattern support in C Sharp 7, and that's where you can use patterns and what the available patterns are. So in C Sharp 7, you can use patterns in switch statements and in is, the is operator. So for example, um, I can use uh, object x equals that if string y is string, sorry, if var y is string x, Sorry, no, I'm talking nonsense. If x is string y, oh, um, so this, the is operator, still takes the type but has a pattern variable after it, and that declares the variable y 
and it's definitely assigned in here, um, and it still exists outside the outside the curly braces, but isn't definitely assigned. Um, and that checks the type. So that's a type pattern um, used with the is operator. You can also use them in switch statements, as we've seen. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, the other types of pattern are the discard pattern, which is not terribly useful for um, ease operators. Um, <coughs> VAR, which is also rarely useful, but now this, uh, this matches any time that X is non-null, whereas the discard pattern always, always matches, and Y has the same type as X. And there's the constant pattern, which is numbers, strings, um, and it just matches if, if the value matches, with rules around um, 0 and 0L being different when they're unboxing and things like that. OK, so C uh, sharp 8 introduces more complex patterns where you can say, uh, rather than just is this whole thing a foo or a bar? I would say, is it a foo with properties that also have patterns that match or that match the, the particular patterns? So here's the, the sample code. We have a base class called item, which has a description, and we have weapons and we have artworks. And those are the only kinds of items we have. Um, it's a somewhat eclectic application. Um, and so we have a collection of items. There's just a boring item because I haven't been allowed for that class. We've got a rocket launcher. We've got Ouvrage du Bon 2, or de, um, a croquet mallet, which is apparently a weapon, um, a bad joke, um, and another artwork of Sunday afternoon on the island of La Grande Jatte. Um, so weapons have damages. Uh, artworks have dates of creation and then we want to say something interesting about any of these items so we're going to call our get fact method and this is implemented with a switch expression using this recursive property function <coughs> so if the item is a weapon with a damage of zero it is harmless so the syntax is the type, and then open brace, and then proper property colon pattern, comma property colon pattern, etc. So that's one using a constant pattern of zero. The patterns can introduce new pattern variables. So here we're introducing D as the damage, and we're also introducing W as the weapon itself. So this is checking. Any weapon where the damage is greater than 500, and we're just printing out the weapon part that we've captured. Um, I mean, in this case, we could we could just print item; it would be equivalent. But you can imagine we could have you know, w dot um, owner or something else that's only known within the weapon. Uh, we don't have to capture the weapon itself. If we only need to know the damage, then we can just capture that. Um, and this will uh, be triggered for any weapon with a damage less than five, less than or equal to 500. Um, if we have a creation, uh, sorry, an artwork, we're matching against the creation date, and we're using a new kind of pattern, which is the deconstruction pattern. Um, so <coughs> deconstruction was also introduced in C sharp seven. <coughs> you can deconstruct tuples to their individual elements, and you can either write deconstruct methods in your own types, or you can write extension methods called deconstruct without parameters to deconstruct other types to constituent parts. So I've got one of those for date time here. So this is just a regular static method, uh, extension method that takes a date and out parameters for the year, month, and day. And in fact, the way I'm implementing it is with tuple deconstruction of I'm creating a tuple of the year, month, and day, and I'm deconstructing that to the outer parameters. And 
That looks like it was because I was trying to be clever and have always deconstruction within deconstruction, but I suspect that very often you would want to implement a deconstruct method by using deconstruction to, in order to assign to all of these parameters in one go. Okay, so that deconstruction, you could do, uh, you can use that elsewhere. So if I do uh, in my main method, um, I could say in year, um, in month, in day equals date time dot UTC now. And that will deconstruct year, month, and day. So those are now separate variables, and I can do it just with var instead. <clears throat> and it knows that year is an int. Um, so that's all cool, but that was in C sharp 7. <clears throat> what is new is doing this within a pattern. So this is saying um, take the creation date. <coughs> deconstruct it to year and discard that, discard, <coughs> excuse me, um, discard that. I could say only match things that were created in January. So the one, oh, I thought I could anyway. Ooh, a proxy sub pattern requires a reference to the, I will have to investigate further. Um, what deconstruction patterns can and can't do. <clears throat> it's possible because I've got the var here. Um, however, that is deconstructing um, via properties within a specified type. We could also, if we were to call get weapon fact on something that is known to be a weapon, then there's no point in specifying the type to start with. We are only interested in the recursive uh, pattern matching. I'm just going to turn my mic off briefly and then cough properly. <laughs> <coughs> That's better. Okay. There's nothing worse than trying to do light coughing to avoid the mic going back. Um, if you so, could see the var in front of year, would then it work with the var? Uh, so, because then you're declaring the year alone to be the variable. Let's see. So that's. I, I can possibly do that year and then, yes, nice. So you do still need something to say, I'm trying to declare. So we've got to, okay, these were both, let's, um, in January. And let's do this one into year, month, and not discard in month, month. And hopefully when we run this now, we'll see the difference between Sunday afternoon that was meant to be in January, <coughs> yes, versus Uvarash Divon created in, in month nine. So yeah, um, it's pretty flexible. <coughs> now, as a C-sharp developer, if you haven't looked at patterns yet for other things, you may be thinking, this is completely unreadable junk. There's no way I'm going to write this. Ease yourself into it, OK? There is, there's nothing saying you have to use switch expressions at all. There's nothing saying you have to use um, uh, pattern matching. Uh, but I would suggest that you kind of push yourself outside your comfort zone, because when you are familiar with this, um, certainly if you're writing any sort of line of business app that's got lots of business rules. Can you imagine if you were writing Pizza Hut's deal matcher or whatever, and you can say, okay, if I've got more than one pizza, then the discount is half the value of those pizzas. If I've got you know, Coke and ice cream, then I get 10% off or whatever. Um, that kind of rule could work really well with this kind of thing. Okay, uh, that's all I think I have for properties and, and patterns. I do have one more feature before I expire completely. Uh, any questions on this or that you've now remembered about normal reference types? Nothing. Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank
<laughs> okay, um, so we'll move on to uh, indexes and ranges. Uh, okay, so indexes and ranges are kind of nice in regular C sharp code. Oh, and my mic has just. Oh, I'm out of battery. <laughs> is this nature's way of telling me something? <laughs> <laughs> is it, is it, um, yeah, okay, we're on. Good. Um, <laughs> So I now fear that after the delay, indexes and ranges will be really disappointing. Um, no, they're, they're good, uh, but you can see them in two ways. One is they're kind of going to be useful when you're dealing with strings and occasionally with arrays and things. If you're using spans, they're going to be awesome. Okay, so if you haven't already looked into span, um, I don't know a lot of span because it's not a language feature, and so you know, I only deal with language features really. Um, but spans are interesting ways of being able to take a view onto some memory in a uniform way, whether that memory was originally an array or a string or allocated unsafely, you know, uh, unmanaged memory. And you can view all of those in a uniform way, and you can take slices of them. So you can say, I've got this big blob of unmanaged memory. Um, OK, I'm going to write my own buffering system over it. That's fine. And then someone could say, OK, I've got a byte array. Can you deal with that? And say, yeah, because I'm just using spans. You pass me a span, I will deal with that. And I can pass you back spans that refer to the same block of memory, but only a slice of it, and it will all be magically um, validated and things without taking any extra overhead of copying stuff. Um, really important for some high performance things uh, coming down the line. Um, and now we get uh, C-sharp syntax to help with it. <clears throat> so there are two new types, index and range, um, and index is a non-negative integer and a from start or from end flag. And the non-negative part is important. So <clears throat> this is an index which is one item from the start. And we can index into a string using the indexer. So the indexer for string has been overloaded to accept an index rather than just an int. And that's all very nice, and as you would probably expect, this is O. This carrot, or hat, whatever you want to call it, um, is the new bit of syntax for an index, and this is two from the end. When you print this, what do you expect that to print? Or let's let's start off with something that you might think would be easier. What about zero from the end? If I print this, what's it going to do? So I'm hearing roughly 50-50 between last character and out of range. It is actually out of range, um, which sort of feels annoyingly asymmetric because you know, zero should be the first and you know, hat zero should be the last. But I want you to think of it, instead of being uh, pointing at the character, it's pointing, it's a cursor. So th that cursor position is zero, and this cursor position is hat zero. Um, is that still vaguely visible from the back? So, Hat zero is zero from the end of the string. You know, um, that point is the very end of the string, so I'm not going backwards at all. And then when you take the indexer, it's returning the character that's, that the cursor is sort of before. So that's why it goes bang, whereas if you do index one, that will return the E, and two would return the C. I'm just going to check that I did actually get that right, so I expect this to print O and C. Wow, 
Uh, that's intriguing. <clears throat> Let me just check whether... No? Okay. Uh, let's just not run the code. Um, <laughs> It worked last time I presented it, that was probably with a different, um, this is a Netcore app, I imagine. Yeah, Netcore app 3.0. I have a different preview of .netcore app 3.0 now. I'm sure when I install Visual Studio 2019, it will start working again. Who knows? Um, so, take it from me, this would have printed uh, <laughs> O and C. But this is relatively boring. Um, it's, it's kind of nice in that in order to get the last character of a string, you can now just use hat1, and you don't have to assign it to an index thing, you can just do hat1. Uh, interestingly, although I've just inlined the value twice there, those now mean different things, because the type of 1, the literal 1, is still int, so that's still going to be using the int um, indexer, whereas this is going to be using the index indexer, which I might or might not be able to see. Um, you cannot write index equals minus one, um, as I said before, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, an index is always non-negative, so it will let you compile that, but that would fail if we were able to execute the rest of the code, it would fail there. Um, some Python folks would expect that to be, oh, that's the equivalent of one from the end. Um, but that's just a kind of recipe for going ahead with invalid data. So um, while I think it may have seemed like a good idea at the time for Python, and you're probably now sufficiently used to it that it seems like a good idea, I generally think that when you go off the end of some data, coming back to the other end probably isn't as good as saying you shouldn't be going from that end at all. Um, there are cases where it could be useful, of course. So, those are just indexes, and indexes themselves would not be terribly worthwhile. But when you get to ranges, it's really fun. So a range is two indexes together, and they're just combined with a dot dot. So this is a range from one from the start to two from the end. There's nothing to say that it has to be like that at all. So here is a range from 1 from the start to 5 from the start. Here is a range from 5 from the end to 1 from the end. Whoopsie. So that is now the last four characters. Um, what happens if you reverse those? What happens? So, uh, if I reverse those, um, then it would construct the range entirely validly, um, but it would fail when you tried to index it. There are other times you could do um, 8 from the start to 5 from the end, and that is valid if the string has, what, at, at least, sorry, at most 13 characters, but at least 8. Um, so, they're, in, they're completely independent, and they're only given a meaning in terms of, if you want sort of some absolute value, then that absolute value is only applied when you try to use it on a string. Um, and you could use the same range on multiple strings and it could be valid on some and invalid on the other. Um, you can use text range, and that takes a substring. So that is just like a different way of calling substring. And I think, in fact, substring also has an overload accepting a range now. Looks like it. Um, so I've pulled that a slice, but that's not a proper slice, because a proper slice wouldn't take up any more memory. This is creating a real string. Whereas if we have a span, if we convert our text into a read-only span of chars, then I can take a span slice, and here we've got a uh, syntax you haven't seen before, uh, the dot dot without anything at the end, which means hat zero. And I mean hat zero because 
the end point is always exclusive in substring. Um, so any range, a range that doesn't have a start is effectively starting from zero from the start. A range that doesn't have an end is effectively zero from the end. And it's somewhat useless, but still valid to just put dot dot. Um, so the nice thing in the code here is that taking this slice is creating one value, read-only span and span itself are value types that are just kind of magic pointery things that uh, the .NET Core JIT compiler knows about. They're deeply understood to be really efficient. So here we have all of the text, and you can imagine that buffer in memory, and we create a span that refers to the same buffer in memory, and then we create a slice of that span that still refers to the same bit of memory. So if you're doing lots of parsing over large bits of text, you can be taking substrings and all kinds of things without ever copying any data. So that's why spans are kind of cool. Um, so that's indexes and ranges. Um, I wish I could show you them working, but I think you have actually kind of seen all there is to see. They're sort of a, an unimpressive looking feature that I think we will all grow to love and say, why didn't we have this before? In particular for being able to say things like, I want to get, you know, I want to strip off the first and last character. Let's just be able to do that. Yay. Um, any questions on indexes and ranges? Can they be variables? Uh, sorry, can they be variables as in like that? Or? Uh, the actual, say, oh, I see. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so int x equals 10, int y equals 5. Yes, sorry, I should have made that clear. These are absolutely fine. Yeah. Um, Sorry, can I specify a character? You could do text is text dot index of space, um, and it can do it. You can obtain the start position that way. There's no way of saying um, that or anything like that. And that's because I should have made it clear. I've only demonstrated this against strings, um, but I could have uh, numbers equals one, three, um, and then we can do uh, what is it? <laughs> and this is really a copy. This is creating a new array by copying. It's it's a little bit worrying that that looks so harmless, but it's actually potentially doing a big copy. Um, if you did numbers dot as span, and then that's a span of int, that's now a slice, and that's that's good. So um, this is where it becomes particularly powerful. We have this unified way of uh, taking instead of substring or copying piece of an array or doing something with a span or so we have this uniform syntax for I wish to access an element by index and I want to uh, access a range within some contiguous sequence um, in a nice uniform way. <clears throat> Any other questions? Does this only work on uh, immutable uh, source? Ah, no. So this is one of the cool things about, oh, this is where I really do wish that it would work. Let's see whether it can work. So let's have our range. Range is, let's go one to the end, uh, end but one, as it were. Um, if we do numbers slice zero plus plus, um, Okay, let's just see. I suspect it's not going to work, but no. Uh, well, that was the wrong one, though. Let's try ranging instead. Oh, yeah, okay. <clears throat> just to work out what's going on there. So, just have the source and the relevant bit. So, we've got our original array, and we're taking a span, not a read-only span, that is 
a slice of that, and then we're incrementing the first element, that zero is as in the first element of the span, which is the second element of the array, which is why we end up with six. Um, there's a really cool way of uh, initializing <coughs> strings. Suppose you want to generate a string of random characters. At the moment, you have to uh, take a length and say, OK, I will allocate a char array. I will populate that char array. Now please create a string with that char array. And that ends up taking a copy. Um, there's a cool constructor in string. Let's see whether it's uh, string.create. Yes. So um, you can pass in a length and some state, and then a span action. I'm just typing this out. <coughs> Char state type, um, because the envelope would be too small to read. Um, where the string.create method creates a span that is mutable and passes that to your delegate that can mutate it. Um, but span is what's called a ref-like struct. So you cannot take span as a field within anything that's not a ref-like struct. So if you were wanting to violate string mutability, you might think, oh, that's fine. OK, I'm going to be given a span of char. I will copy that out somewhere. Then when the string has been created, I can mutate that span of char. And then that will mutate the string. And that violates everything we know about strings. But given the way that ref structs work, and ref structs are C sharp 7.2 or 7.3, um, you wouldn't be able to let that span escape the stack effectively. So you only get to play with it while the string is being constructed. By the time string.create returns, the string is immutable as you'd expect it to be, but you get to write those random characters into the string directly, and there's no copying involved at all. It's really cool. Um, that's not C sharp 8, but it's fun. Uh, good question about the immutability, though, because the, the whole spans being uh, views over a data source and potentially writable views is really important. OK, I have been speaking for over an hour and a half, I think. Um, I'm not sure that my voice can manage much more. And frankly, the async stuff is kind of a bit, it's cool if you've ever had to write an async iterator. It's like, that's really annoying. I want language support. Yeah, you have language support. There's not a lot more to say. Um, and likewise, disposable. Um, John, just very briefly, what's yeah. the difference between the iAsync I -Async iterator and the observables? There is. So uh, Rx, or system.interactive, had an async enumerable. Uh, it's not the same. Yay. Uh, I think there's going to be a version 4 of Rx which does use the one that's going to be in the framework. But it means that if, like me, you have a bunch of libraries that expose async enumerables, um, I'm going to need to think about what to do uh, for that, because it's not going to be terribly simple. Um, I'm hoping there will be some way to say, OK, re-implement what I've got using yield return, and then have an um, old interface view over the new interface I don't know exactly yet, but um, yeah, they're not the same. It's kind of annoying, such is life. Um, there's one other feature that's not async, but async reminded me because of disposable. Uh, let's just do it anywhere. <coughs> um, you can now write uh, using um, var streaming or <coughs> memory stream. Uh, using uh, well, stream 2 equals new memory stream. I haven't actually checked that this works. Um, but Matt's told me about it, so it should. Uh, and it does, yay! Um, and you know, stream.write, or stream.copy to stream 2. And that is equivalent to adding a lot of braces and making everything nest further in. Um, and it just gets disposed at the end of the block. So that's a tiny, tiny, tiny feature that I've never even bothered to explain before. Um, there are other features that are 
weirder and cooler that may be coming. So uh, interface default methods, which is where you write an interface and then put some code in it, which we've never really done before. Um, and this is uh, not entirely coincidentally like Java's default interfaces uh, because it'll help Xamarin. Um, so maybe next week, the next meetup, um, ask Jim about them. Ask him how they're going to work and say that <laughs> question from me and he will thank me, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, so it lets you imagine um, that instead of having enumerable dot count as an extension method, imagine that we had count as a default method within I enumerable of T. So it had a default implementation of using var iterator equals get enumerator and then while iterator dot move next count plus plus return count. <clears throat> and then list of T and any I list of T in fact could override that implementation and provide a decent one, but everything would have it. And then you could be assured that if you are calling the count method on something that could support it efficiently, it would be efficient. Whereas with enumerable.count, so the, the linked objects extension method, if I've got something else that doesn't happen to implement I list of T or I collection of T or whatever, but still has a fast way of counting, there's no way I can tell the type system and tell enumerable.count, hey, over here, you know, use this one. So um, obviously it's too late for link, but uh, it, it allows that sort of more nuanced, I've got a better implementation while allowing a default implementation. There may or may not be, and probably won't be, um, shapes, um, which is a sort of traits-like aspect of a C-sharp future uh, where you, it's designed to solve problems like, I want a generic type I, I want foo of t, where t is something like a number, where I can add two of them together and get the same type, multiply the two of them together and get the same type, because then I can do some stats. And I can do that for any law, ink, float, decimal, etc. But there's no way of expressing that shape of a type at the moment. Um, so that may or may not happen. It feels like it's one of those features. If you don't need it, you're not going to want to use it and not going to want to learn about it. If you do need it, it's going to be so handy. Um, so that's a real balancing act for the team. Uh, and record types are probably not going to be in C sharp 8. Um, we all go sad, sad face. Um, but uh, the team is still working on them. It's just that they want to get it right, which I think is the right call. Um, I am rapidly fading at this point. Any further questions? No, you have been very, very quiet. Uh, wow. I hope this is not me being intimidating. I tried my best not to be intimidating. Any questions? I've got, I've got really dumb questions. Do you want, oh, do you want this? Right. Uh, okay. It's just so dumb, I don't want to. Okay, <laughs> I can really read the questions. Sure. Sure. Uh, questions. I was just intrigued at something you did very, uh, at the very beginning where you did the example of the first name, the middle name, and the last name. Yep. And you said, um, uh, you know, absolutely never do this. Right. Because, of course, different countries. Um, and I was just intrigued how you would deal with that. In, uh, how, so, um, there is a speaker who you should absolutely try to get here sometime called Dom Davis. Don't know whether you know Dom. Fascinating guy, very funny. Uh, he has a whole talk on how to not model names. Um, I believe he went through a long period of you know, requirements gathering, whatever, for a company he was working for at the end. And he was trying to work out why. Why do you need the customer's name? And the result at the end of a long way was they wanted to put it at the start of an email. They wanted to put dear something. <clears throat> that doesn't need any complex modeling. It just needs a text box saying, how do you want us to refer to you in emails? <laughs> Store it as a string, put that string, nice and simple. Um, I will just use this opportunity because it's such a lovely example of how we are culturally sort of blinkered. And this is another example of why diversity matters. Um, Somewhat extreme one. Uh, in no time, I have dates, and I do have do support multiple calendar systems. So I thought, okay, what's going to be in common between dates? They can have eras, and that gets tricky. Um, but let's 
take an absolute year so that you know one BC ends up being minus two and things. Um, or well, actually, no, just minus one. Uh, but every every date is going to have a year, month, and day. All good. Model loads of calendars that way, and then we got a feature request for the Wondrous or Baha'i calendar. It's like, okay, this is an interesting calendar system. 19 months of 19 days, and then the days that are left over. The days, <laughs> the days of wonder. They are not in a month. I have modeled that you could always ask a date what month it was in. And in some ways, I shouldn't have done that, because that is not universally applicable. Same with Gorlandry. Dave Gorman did a new <laughs> Right. <laughs> but this is a calendar system that is actually used. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and things like modeling date of birth as year, month, day, um, a, a more real world actually affects millions of people kind of thing. Uh, there are healthcare systems where you sign people up with their date of birth and let's make it really easy. You have your vaccinations, you know, we'll, maybe we'll send your vaccination reminder out on your birthday. That's fine until you come to a culture which celebrates birthdays, not in terms of actually a, a date, just you know how many years old you are and that's all. So when you say, oh, what's your date of birth? They'll, they could tell you the year, but not a specific date. So the, the administrator's putting in the, the data, I'll just put January the 1st. And then half the country gets their vaccination <laughs> line on the same date, and then everything gets overrun. Uh, so yeah, the better we can understand our users and where they are, that may well not be the same problems that we face, uh, the better software we will write. And that's probably a far more important lesson, actually, to learn than anything about each other. <laughs> <laughs> well, don't, don't unplug anything. Okay. Just, I will, I'm in trouble already. <laughs> so, and I would just like to put, um, yes, to give a massive round of applause to John. <laughs>